Okay, Councillor. Before we move on, just a few uh, prelims. Uh, I think there's a round of 20 item agenda here, and we have, which includes four motions. And uh, just with regard to matters arising, any correspondence or items for noting, and I would request a proposer and seconder, not allowing to our very little discussion on any of those issues. Uh, next thing, I would uh, welcome uh, Mr. John News, who is the new director of Environment and Place. You're very welcome to your post, John. I'm looking forward to working with you as the chair and as councillors in general over the time ahead. You're very welcome. Thank you. Just a few other prelims. Uh, Councillor Alex Baird has asked me for, uh, to get in on any urgent and relevant business, which I have agreed to, and that's just the one item. This evening, we will be keeping on topic. And just for everyone's uh, consideration out there, do not speak over the chair or any other councillor when they are speaking. Uh, please show and demonstrate respect to everyone. So thank you, and that's at all times. Moving on the agenda, and um, first of all, our apologies. Excuse me, Chair. Later. Excuse me, Chair. Could IT contact uh, Councillor Bert Wilson, please? Thank you. No problem, Councillor Warrington. Thank you. Councillor McGuire, Sinn Féin Group Leader. Uh, just one apology from the Sinn Féin Group, uh, Councillor Anne Marie Donnelly. Thank you, Councillor McGuire. Over to the Ulster Unionist Party, and as Councillor Robert Irvine. There are no apologies. All right, put you out there. Sorry, go ahead again. Sorry, no apologies from the UUP. Thank you. Thank you. Democratic Unionist Party, Councillor Paul Robinson. Thank you, Chair. There's no apologies from the Democratic Unionist Party tonight. Thank you. And to the SDLP, uh, Councillor Mary Gardy. You on here? Thank you, Gardy. Chair. Um, great to be back in the chamber with us all. And just apologies for Councillor Adam Gannon and some of the Fermanagh councillors may have to leave early to see throughout the meeting. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Gardy. And down to single party, uh, I think Councillor Stephen Donnelly's on the meeting. Uh, we haven't received any apologies from there. Any apologies from the independents? Chair, uh, Councillor Eamon Keenan uh, sends apologies. Just he's going to be five or ten minutes late, but he hopes to be joining us very shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McAleer. And my way of working this evening, just to make you all aware, this is the first hybrid meeting, and uh, those who wishing to uh, wishing to speak on any topic uh, as we move forward in the agenda, I will be taking the councillors in the chamber first, and then moving on to the people who are coming in directly. And that is what I have decided this evening. We'll see how this works. So thank you for your cooperation. We'll hopefully get through the business. I've also decided to bring uh, part two business forward, and that'll be it'll be after uh, before the notices of four fourteen. So we're bringing part two to there and get that business dealt with, and then we'll be able to concentrate on the four motions and the item of any urgent and relevant business. So we're, we're relying on some cooperation. Okay, on to item two in the agenda. And it's to confirm and sign the minutes of the council meeting held on the 7th of September, 2021, paper A for accuracy, page one, page two, page three, page four, page five, Page six, page seven, page eight, page nine, page ten, page eleven, page twelve, page thirteen, page fourteen, page fifteen, 
page 16, page 17, page 18, and page 19. I'll move for a proposal and second for the adoption of the minutes. Mr. Robert Irvine. Proposed, Chair. Proposed adoption. Can we have a seconder? Proposed, Chair. Seconded by Councillor Dehan. Thank you. And all are all agreed. Thanks again for that. Okay. Move on, on now to item three as to confirm and sign the minutes of the special council meeting held on the 29th of September. 2021 paper B and it's for accuracy and it's page one. Um, we have our proposer and seconder for the adoption. Mr. Tommy McGuire. I propose, Chair. Sorry, Councillor McGuire. Uh, it'll have to be Councillor McCaffrey or Councillor McAleer or Councillor Rennie. Sorry, my fault. Chair. Councillor McAleer. I, I'm, I'm happy enough to propose the note because that's a reflection of what happened. But just a query, if if we hadn't have attended that meeting, how would the minutes be noted? I'll bring the Chief Executive in to answer your query. Thank you, Councillor McAleer. They, they wouldn't be chair if someone who wasn't in attendance at the meeting, it would just be moved to the next agenda when we would have had the appropriate members in attendance. Thank you, Chief Executive. Just for, just for clarification there, if we had been advised not to attend that meeting, so if myself and Councillor Rennie hadn't attended, how would the minutes be signed off if there wasn't two councillors then to, to propose and second the note? That's my question. Thank you, Chair. Executive. Well, if there weren't more than two councillors in attendance, Chair, there wouldn't have been a record of the meeting. We would just simply have noted the presiding yeah. Chair. I'm very happy to second that. Thank you, Councillor <laughs> Paul Rennie. The adoption of the minute. So as proposed by Councillor McAleer and seconded by Councillor Paul Rennie, MBE. Thank you. Okay, item four, declarations of interest, if any. Just clarify, uh, call in user two. Can you please identify yourself? Call in user two. Councillor Clark. Thank you, Councillor Clark. As I said before, item four, declarations of interest. No indications of declaration of interest. Okay, on to item five. And as matters are rising from the council meeting dated the 7th of September, 2021, where matters are rising. <coughs> so it's page one, page two, page three, Chief Executive. Thank you, Chair. Just on page three, uh, reference is made to the informal meeting regarding Brawla High School, uh, and that meeting was held here on the 30th of September. There were, there were two specific uh, proposals and recommendations that, that came from the meeting, so are before the Council for consideration. Firstly, that uh, the Council would write to the shared island unit to ask them to undertake action research into actual and perceived barriers to educational provision uh, on a cross-border basis and to engage with the relevant government departments north and south as part of this research and to identify the potential for pilot projects in this regard. And secondly, Chair, that we would write to the Education Authority to undertake an urgent review into the transport provision for those children who have been affected by the closure of Brawla High School and specific reference was made to the uh, added duration now of the school day for the pupils in question and a particular impact on children with special needs. It was also proposed here that we would reconvene the group on receipt of a response from the shared island unit and to encourage them to engage uh, with the group who are in attendance. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Executive. I think this issue has been well aired, so I'm not uh, 
for a lot of discussion on it, so we're, we're moving on. Oh, sorry, trying to watch two screens here, Councillor Curry. The next. Gurmogadi Kaihurli, and I won't take any time. Just thank Alison again and the council team there for convening that meeting. Um, it was a very um, positive meeting, I think, and just look forward um, to the outcome of it and, and further work. So just to formally propose um, those uh, proposals that we had made in, in the meeting, Chair, just to recommend them to the council um, and to formally propose, Chair Gurmogadi. Thank you, Councillor Curry. Okay, you've heard the proposal. I'll be Councillor Feeney. That's Councillor yeah, Sorry. Come yeah, on. thank you, Chair. Yeah, I just, I just second it. Um, there. Okay, all agreed. Thank you for that. Moving on with the uh, matters raising, page three, page four, Chief Executive. Thank you, Chair. Just two items of correspondence for noting for members. Uh, the first is a response from the Policing Board in relation to the definition of the Board's interpretation of the word ethical. Uh, and members will have seen in the letter that this was not something that was commented upon uh, by the Board's membership. And the second letter from the Police Service um, setting out the, the rationale for the uh, Police Service's continued participation in the project. Okay, thank you, Alison. Can we have a proposal and second to the note? I'll just take a proposal and second to the note first, and that's Councillor Erskine and Councillor Warrington second. Councillor Warrington. Trying to take people from in the chamber, we'll, we'll move on. Uh, who's coming in here now? Councillor McAleer, come in. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, I suppose I was a bit disappointed with this reply. Um, first of all, the, the fact that the the term ethical wasn't even discussed, never mind addressed. And then uh, in the second letter, actually looking at the, the Code of Ethics, which was revised in 2008, and seemingly is more kind of guided towards the uh, individual police officer's behaviour as opposed to the overall um, PSNA as an organisation. Although it states uh, at numerous times through it that it's based on the Europe, European Convention of Human Rights that uh, the Policing Board Chair notes in the in the preamble about a police service that has a protection of human rights as its core value. Um, the Chief Constable notes within it that the code describes a framework of ethical standards along with an accountable human rights approach to policing that demands the very best from our officers and provides the context within which we deliver an effective policing service to all communities. It goes through a number of points and I'll not dwell on them because obviously we're tight for time again tonight. Um, it talks about um, police officers uh, not subjecting any person to torture, cruel and human degrading treatment or punishment. Uh, whether on or off duty, police officers should not behave in a way as likely to bring discredit upon the police force. It talks about Article 7 to deal with integrity, Article 10, the duty of supervisors. It talks about the treatment of persons in Article 1.4 of the code which restates Article 3 of the ECHR, which provides that no one shall be subjected to torture or inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. And that's a direct quote. This that's is an absolute... Right. Asking, be conscious of your time. Yeah, I'm just getting very near. So this is absolute right. There's no justification for failing to comply with a standard to do so will result in disciplinary and or criminal action. This is all lifted directly from the Code of Ethics that we were... Attached or advised to read through, so I my question would be, and I would request that we go back to the the two bodies that we've addressed here. How does any of this sit with cooperating with an apartheid state and its security forces? How can this be defended? And each shifting the blame to the policing board or the PSNA or the ombudsman or the justice minister or the EU doesn't detract from the fact that the only thing that this does is enable apartheid. And we must take a firm stance on this, as was rightly done against apartheid in South Africa. We need to call it out for what it is and challenge and oppose it at every opportunity. The, the PSNA has an opportunity to lead by example here, and what it chooses to do next will be very interesting to watch. So I would like to propose that we go back and query those points that I've raised as part of the Code of Ethics. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor McAleer. Uh, Councillor Eamon Keenan, please bring your remarks to a very sharp conclusion. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, well, 
I suppose with regard to ethics, I suppose the, the Gestapo probably thought that they were working within the, a certain code of ethics, but uh, it's proved that they're actually war criminals. And I think history will prove that uh, the Israelis are, are no different. Thank you. To ask you be very, very careful with your language, second, yeah. Mr. Keenan. Seconded. Are I'll we agreed? Second, yeah. Are we agreed? No. no. We have dissension in the room no. and in the wider chamber. Okay. Without further ado, I'm going to put that to the chamber and we're going to test our vote here. Chair, can I call this a recorded vote too, please? Yes, that's not a problem. Okay. We're just getting it set up here now for the vote. Hold on, I just have to activate you. Mr. Uh, good Margaret. Uh, Carly, just uh, if we could have clarification of what exactly we are voting on. Just well, I'll ask to, Councillor McAleer to, to come on to, very quickly and give a resume of what he is proposing. Councillor McAleer. Uh, right, okay. It's just, I suppose, going through the points that I've listed or the examples that I've listed from the Code of Ethics, query on how it sits with cooperating with an apartheid state and its security forces asking how it's been defended and again shifting the blame onto other bodies or other representative organizations or statutory bodies um that doesn't take away from the fact that what this is doing is enabling apartheid and encouraging the psni to take a, tra a strong stance uh, to lead by example here and to not be implicit or complicit with the acts of apartheid of and already what the world already knows is an apartheid state and an apartheid security force thank you chair Thank you. Does that clarify the situation, Councillor McGuire? Okay. We're ready for a vote. Okay. You have one minute to vote. Just make your selection. On via WebEx and then hit submit on the bottom right. So Councillor Finney, Councillor Donnelly, just make a selection then hit submit. Sorry, so, sorry, I missed the start. What you press letter A, what do you do then? On the bottom right hand corner, there's a submit, submit button. button. Hmm. Okay, members, the vote has now closed. Okay. Just going to give you a breakdown of the vote here. And. 44.4% voted yes, 44.4% voted no, and 11.3% abstained. Hold on, let me see what Chairman, uh, can I ask, would there have been any errors in that voting? Did people have difficulty? It would just be interesting. Would just the executive come on here. Thanks. Thanks. Here we are now. Got it. Well, Chair, no, I'm. I suppose one of the things that we had explained to members when we were moving to the electronic voting system was there is only the opportunity to vote once, uh, and that's why there's the the summary. There's not an opportunity to change the vote. I suppose maybe I should say more more accurately, Chair, um, which is why the the summary of the vote is uh, is noted before the the voting actually commences. So, Chair, we'll just uh, read then the, the record, uh, the voting record here into, into the system now, just if you bear with us, please. Okay. As Chair, I said, can I... Before, as I said before, councillors, please bear with us on this one. This is all new. Chair, so, can, can I just... 
change that we have then are four members, uh, those members voting for nine, those voting against six, two members abstained, and 17, 17 members did not vote. So that is carried. Yeah, and just on a little point of information, I would definitely be inclined to think of the 17 that didn't answer, did have some difficulty. I would suggest, and I know we have thrashed this to the nth degree, but if, you know, if people did have difficulty, perhaps another refresher training, because votes are too important to let slide, in my opinion, and particularly that one, as Emmett had clearly outlined, Gurmagat. Thank you for your comments, Councillor Swift. Chair, uh, could you just clarify that that people are aware that they have to hit the submit button as opposed to selecting an option and I, then just letting the timer run out i'm going Thanks. to ask the chief executive to comment once more on this issue and then we're moving on okay well, chair i think you clearly summarized the procedure for members and it was reminded then over the the audio from our webex support we obviously the the votes are time bound and then members need to to vote within the time available Okay, as the vote closed, the IT. Thank you. Still what matters are raising. Page four, page five. Page five, Chief Executive. <clears throat> Uh, thanks, Chair. Just one item of correspondence. Um, it's in members' other folder, dated the 4th of October from the Minister of Finance, and this is in relation to the Council's request that the Executive make provision from within its own resources for the top-up of the universal credit to be retained. Um, so the, the Minister has restated the position of support for the Communities Minister and also has advised that the Executive in the, is in the process of preparing for a three-year budget and has obviously encouraged councils uh, to also to continue to apply pressure to the British government to maintain the uplift uh, to the welfare payments. Okay, thank you, Chief Executive. I remind councillors that that is for noting. So, Councillor John McClory. John? I was going to speak on that topic but it's already voted on, so I'm not going to waste your time. Oh, thank you. Call in user. Call in user three, please identify yourself. Call in user three. Call in user three. Councillor Clark. I don't know what you're doing, Councillor Clark. You're moving from two to three, but we'll have to bear with it for now. Thank you. Okay, okay moving on. Councillor or Chair, I have my hand up. Councillor Warrington. Uh, two things. One, um, Councillor uh, Councillor Bert Wilson's in trouble again. If IT could contact him. And also, Chair, uh, Chair uh, it's, uh, it's, it's quite all right now. It's quite all right. Yes, yeah, just come back. On previous Thank occasions, you. that you'd be better coming onto a room within the Grange, and then you could access properly. But uh, you haven't done that, so we're going to have to bear with it. And just the other uh, question, quickly, Chair, please, is the lex of uh, calling user number three, which is Councillor Sean Clark. Um, uh, was he able to vote in the previous vote? I don't think he was. Thank you. I bring the chief executive in once more to clarify that whole situation for you. Okay, thank you. No, chair, this is one of the the points we clarified that the mechanism once the council determined it was proceeding to electronic voting, the only mechanisms for doing that are in the chamber here or mm -hmm. accessing remotely via WebEx. But if you access only by phone, there's not that facility. And I believe that Councillor Clark was was advised accordingly. Thank you. Okay, page five. Uh, Councillor Warrington, can you take your hand down? Uh, Councillor Coffey. 
Yeah, thank you, Chair. First of all, I have to say that the uh, this this meeting is. I know it's it's difficult for yourself as a chair, but I have to say that the whole thing is is not far off a shambles in many regards. I, I think the fact that certain councillors can't even cast their votes uh, under this hybrid system, and that other councillors like myself have uh, effectively been. Mr. Coffey, I'd ask you to withdraw your comment. What what comment? You made some nasty remarks there. Which one? Which one, Chair? I, I'm, I generally don't understand what you're saying. Uh, I, I am I, I am convinced that this is turning into it. But anyway, uh, my point is I wanted to speak about the letter from uh, uh, the Finance Minister. Uh, I, I'm happy to propose to note that uh, document. But in regard to, uh, um, I want to make a proposal as well. Uh, the Minister has encouraged this Council uh, to take the lead in standing up for residents in our council area, and it affects all of our residents, no matter what your religion, your colour, your creed, your orientation, or whatever. Uh, it's 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 an issue that affects a lot of people. For, Twenty pounds uh, universal credit uh, has been reduced by the Tory government, and it's an absolute disgrace. Uh, I I would want to put this uh, propose that this council puts itself uh, and writes to uh, uh, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson. And states just what this means to our residents, what this means to people in our council area who have an overwhelming uh, tendency to rely on this sort of money for benefits. The Tories are cutting uh, the lifeline to our, our communities. And I want to propose that our council sends uh, a, a signal. We, they're not going to listen to us, we know that, but at least we want to put it on the record that we stand opposed to what's happening in our community. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Coffey. Councillor McAleer. Yes, Chair, absolutely happy to second that. I think, again, the, the letters, well, we're kind of used to them now. It's passing the book to somebody else. But I saw a headline um, in this week's Throne Constitution being advertised that there are, in West Throne, there are 3,200 families that are impacted by the withdrawal of what's essentially a lifeline of the universal credit pay line, uh, payment and also uh, a video doing the rounds of uh, a gentleman called Dominic Hutchins who was uh, confronting uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg uh, on the streets about the the very real impact of universal credit and of PIP assessments and the, the very real impact that that has on people from working class backgrounds, people who have disabilities and really it's 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 not just pathetic it's actually it actually is a matter of life and death that that that's how severe this is and i think we have to take the strongest possible stance that we can it's very unfortunate that uh, the stormont government and the ministers up there aren't willing to consider uh, paying out this this lifeline to the people of the area but if they're not willing to do that then we have to go to the next level and that is the the government. So I'm quite happy to second Councillor Coffey's remarks on this approval. Councillor Josephine Dehan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, I want to support um, uh, Councillor Coffey's proposal, Chair. I think that uh, this is a national disgrace, and I think it uh, reflects very badly on our society that in their hour of need, we cannot support needy families, vulnerable families. That extra £20 per week was an absolute lifeline to many people. And it's something that must be continued. It is absolutely critical to their welfare and well-being uh, that that be continued. And I think uh, uh, the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, you know, if he has a shred of humanity, then he should listen with his heart as well as with her with his ears to the pleas uh, from right around uh, uh, the country uh, that this is totally unacceptable to withdraw this lifeline at a time of great need. So I do support uh, Councillor Coffey in, in, in his proposal. I don't support his comments that this meeting is a shambles. I think you're chairing it very well. It will probably take a little bit of time for us to get used to the uh, electronic voting, but it is very simple, very straightforward. 
and uh, I'm very hopeful that it will be successful uh, uh, in the not too distant future. Thank you, Chair. Well, first of all, can I thank you for your courteous and positive comments, Councillor Dehan, and thank you for your remarks. Uh, moving on now to Councillor Anne-Marie Fitzgerald, who's in the chamber. I suppose from my end and the party end, we do support the motion and we do recognise the hardship that, that is out there. And us as a party has been continuing for many years of trying to make uh, Westminster Boris Johnson to stop the Tory cuts. It's been on now for 10, 12 years and they're still having a deep impact on us. And us as a party, we have taken the lead and we have wrote to the uh, um, Westminster, we wrote to the um, Richie Sunar, I think I can't recall his correct name, but um, we're doing everything that we can. And it was just said that if Stormont can't do it, other people can't do it. Sadly, sadly, we have a government in Stormont and they can't do it. Um, years ago when this was shoved on our, on our laps, uh, Martin McGuinness um, fought hard um, till the end, until well, we had to take it. We had to take the financial fall. It was something that through registration, le legislation minister or Westminster gave over to us. And Scotland and Wales also had to take this hardship fund on. And through mitigation measures, we tried the best we can. And we, um, with the hardship that's been dealt here, we have the least um, impact. But that £20 is huge. It's huge. A lot of people are relying on it. It's getting cold. The working class families, the disability, the elderly, it's, it's a huge impact. And I want to support the motion. Thank you, Councillor Fitzgerald. Councillor Raymond Keenan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, uh, fully support the motion. Um, a twenty pound a week. Sorry, it's not a motion. Not a motion. Uh, uh, the proposal, yeah. Um. So the, the, the twenty pound a week, it uh, mightn't seem like much to uh, Boris Johnson or anyone else in his party. The Bedford, probably just a fancy bottle of red wine once a week, or maybe not. But it, it's the difference between eating and heating for many. In our communities, and uh, the previous speaker said that the government had to accept it. Well, I don't know. It's supposed to be a devolved government, it's supposed to be able to stand up and fight for the communities. I think instead of down, this council, I know you can definitely stand up and say no. Thank you for your comments. It's a Seamus Green. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, uh, and uh, just as far as the devolved government's concerned, I realise that everybody does know that there's a block grant and uh, if if the devolved government uh, mit mitigates the, the £20 a week, it would cost £120 million a year, which would have to come out of roads or education or uh, health. So I think it's a wee bit... Um, it's a wee bit unfair to be saying that the 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 devolved government sh should uh, pay for it because uh, uh, saying that, well, then we have to find out where we're going to take the cuts from. Uh, so maybe whoever be proposed that would also say where the the cuts should come from. Um, the other thing is, uh, in the last few months, just road tax as as in fuel for people's cars. Has went up by twenty to thirty per liter, uh, which I done a quick calculation there. It works out about uh, four hundred pound a year extra tax on a, the average rural uh, dweller that's filling up their tank once a week. Mm. Uh, so that's four hundred pound on top if you're a, a rural uh, dweller of tax. That's just tax alone. Uh, on on road fuel as something sixty two percent taxes on fuel. So uh, when we're talking about taxes and taking money from the poor and from rural people, we can add that in as well. Uh, it's actually quite disgraceful, and I'm sure that would pay for the twenty pound a week if they use that money that they're taking from us, that stealth tax that that the rich pay at the same level as the poor. Uh, and it's quite disgraceful. So I'll just throw that in there as well. Thank you, Councillor Green. Okay, no more discussion. On this has been proposed by Councillor Coffey and seconded by Councillor Keaton. Sorry, Councillor McAleer, and supported by Councillor Keaton that a letter be sent. Are we all agreed? All agreed. No dissension? Okay. 
we will all, um, I'll ask all councillors to please bear in mind our timings here. Page five, page six, page seven, page eight, Chief Executive. Thank you, Chair. T uh, two items of correspondence. Uh, the first, Chair, is a letter from Dara, the Minister, dated the 30th of the 9th, uh, sorry, 30th of September, uh, regarding the Council's concerns in relation to perceived conflicts of interest in relation to the consultancy team working on the own Kilu uh, draft conservation management plan. And uh, we had asked specific clarification as to how those conflicts of interest would be managed. And the minister had advised they'd be reviewed on a case-by-case a -case basis, but that the um, contractor is required to formally notify the department of any new or emerging conflicts. So that's the, the first letter, Chair. And uh, you may wish to take comment on that before moving to the second hey, can item. We, can we have a proposal and second of a note? Ms. Erskine. Noted, Chair. Ms. Erskine. Seconder. Mr. Paul Robinson. I second that. Okay. We have now coming in on this issue, uh, Councillor Seamus Green. Mr. Green. Okay, Councillor Green. My apologies. On. I think I had my hand up from the previous time, Chair. Apologies. Um, Councillor Green. Councillor Emmett, Emmett McAleer. Yes, Chair, it's just, I suppose, to know there's like, there's no, there seems to be no cognizance of the reality of what's happening here. The the minister and his department seem so far devolved from reality. It's it's quite unbelievable. It's quite shocking. But it seems to be not just confined to this department. The fact that it's it's really a self monitoring or self policing from these companies to declare an interest when the the interest is is quite striking, um, and the priorities of the department to protect the environment to protect agriculture. Uh, seemingly couldn't be further from his mind when, with this response and reading into this response. But it's it's endemic of what's happening in Stormont. When you look at the Department for Infrastructure and their recruitment of the same consultancy firm who actually did the work for Dalradian's Waste Management Plan to subsequently evaluate that at the tune of £300,000 to the taxpayer, to the ratepayer. When we're talking about money that could be better spent providing uh, support for people who are needing the £20 uplift for universal credit. There's numerous examples of where that money could be recruited from and, and re-sent from. But it's another disappointing, another another waste of our time really reading this letter. There's there's no there's seemingly no point discussing with this minister because he doesn't want to have anything to do with the protection of either the environment or long term interests of family farms in the local area. It's just highly disappointing, Chair. Thank you very much for your comments, uh, Councillor McAleer. Next up is Councillor O'Coffey. Donald. Yeah, I'm happy to propose to note this document, uh, despite the fact that it's... I think it's, proposed uh, and noted. Has it proposed and noted, is it, already? Yeah, it has. Okay, in which case, I'm just... Uh, I, 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 I won't re spend too much time. I think it's absolute disgrace, frankly. Uh, the, the, the idea that you can have a consultancy company that does uh, promotional work on one hand and on the other hand, uh, they're doing the work uh, of a regulatory authority. On the other, in terms of um, analysing the, uh, you know, the the wherewithals of an application in the very same industry. So, uh, you know, it's it is a uh, uh, clear it's perceived conflict of interest, and yet another yet another storm at department uh, uh, and minister appears completely. Uh, unaware of um, how it would uh, would appear to the public, uh, and I think the public will draw their own conclusions around this. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Coffey. Then for Chief the Executive. thank you, Chair. The the second letter is also from the Dara Minister. Uh, it was received yesterday, the fourth of October, and this is in response to the Council's inquiries regarding the level of consultation undertaken by the Department with local beekeeper associations. And I suppose just to note, Chair, that this letter sets out the requirements for priority species, but no reference is made um, to the query that the Council actually posed. Okay, can we propose and second it a note? Sir Robinson? Posed the note. 
Thank you. Seconder for Lodi. Councillor Erskine, Deborah Erskine. Okay, thank you. And a couple of speakers wanting to come in again. Councillor Donal O'Coffey. Okay, Councillor John McClarty. Yeah, I was going to propose. Uh, obviously, disappointed that it hasn't fully addressed the issues that we raised to do with our own local bee bees and also the consultation with local beekeepers. But uh, obviously, we'd note it. But it's disappointing. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Uh, Page eight, page nine, page ten, page eleven, and page twelve, Chief Executive. Chair, this is just in relation to the adopted motion regarding the proposed closure of the OMA AIB branch. Three letters to, to draw to members' attention, Chair. Uh, firstly, from the Department of Finance dated the 30th of September from the Minister. Secondly, from OMA Chamber of Commerce, um, both of which are also expressing their concern and in relation to OMA Chamber of Commerce stating their um, desire to continue to wish, or sorry, to work with the Council uh, lobbying against this, this issue. And uh, today we received a response from the Financial Services Union, which again has expressed its extreme concern and also its willingness to meet with the Council on this matter, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Executive. First of all, I'm going to ask for a proposal and seconder to note, and then we'll allow comments. Councillor Barry McAdoff. I propose to note, Chair, and then want to make comments, obviously. Okay, we'll have a seconder for noting. Councillor Paul Robinson. Okay, Councillor McAdoff. Thank you, Chair. Um, welcome the three letters, and uh, in particular, the Minister's letter, I think, is, is helpful. I um, also want to thank councillors uh, across all parties and none who supported the motion uh, last month. Now, since then, we have met with relevant bodies who have a role, who have an influence or an insight into banking services. And these include the Financial Conduct Authority, senior AIB managers, uh, and the Consumer Council. And the Consumer Council told us yesterday that uh, they're going to carry out a major research exercise and they want to work with this council closely so that uh, we can work together to influence public policy and legislation. Um, I think what's clear from the series of engagements so far that are have yet to be completed, we've got to meet the Chamber of Commerce to agree a, a, a joint plan of action, and also um, the Financial Services Union has stated. But what we've found out so far is that this is clearly a commercial decision with no sense of community loyalty or social responsibility. And... Uh, we found out too that the Financial Conduct Authority is particularly interested in the subject of access to cash as opposed to access to banking services. And we found out yesterday, if we didn't already know, that the Consumer Council obviously doesn't have any powers to stop the closure. But behind all the data are real people. And the impact on vulnerable customers, uh, low-income families, uh, people in rural communities, people who are digitally excluded, um, people who suffer health problems, but micro businesses form the backbone of our economy, and the town centre vitality of OMA. All of these things are at stake. So, obviously, then, Chair, we're going to meet with the Chamber of Commerce and the Financial Services Union. But in relation to Conor Murphy's letter, um, he says that he speaks with the joint authority here of Deirdre Hargy and Gordon Lenz ministers uh, respectively for communities and the economy. He shares our concern and he has written to local banks, all local banks, asking them to pause their closures for at least 12 months. And that's supported by the Financial Conduct Authority. He quite rightly points us in the direction again of the British government with responsibility for regulating financial services. So I would like to make a proposal that this council write to the British Secretary of State. In this instance, Brandon Lewis, asking him and his government to exert maximum influence to pause all bank closures uh, for at least 12 months so that this can be reviewed and revisited. And I'm speaking, obviously, in the context of the AIB bank closure in OMA, but also mindful that other colleagues have spoken recently about closures in Lesniski and Balik and, and other, pla Baligali, uh, other places. Thank you, Chair. 
So that's a proposal. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor McAdoff. Councillor Fitzgerald. Yes, just done with Barry. I was saying yes, we did meet with um, the Chief Executive, um, Naoma Chunder, and Scott Kennedy, who is the Director of Finance from Consumer Council. It was a very good meeting, and there were as, as much as us, they were exasperated and quite um, angry at what is going on. And they, get, they did give us a few interesting facts. Um, they told us that um, the banking um, here in the north um, is completely different than to England, Scotland, Wales. It says that we have a greater rurality. And indeed, the number of closures here compared to England, Scotland, and Wales, we were sitting at 21% of closures locally, while um, the other regions are sitting at 16%. And, um, but with that saying, they, um, they um, stated and stressed that we are rurally um, twice as great here in the north, and we are much greater impacted. So just that they are stating then that they're um, working hard behind the scenes and that Westminster always seem to be using the data from England, Scotland and Wales to gather up their what they call consultation responses. And there's no available data here from the north. And but there is work going forward and working with the council will all data will be going forward and they'll be putting their own um, stronger evidence based approach to um, Westminster. And it was asked that um, Nadine yesterday had Storm had done a bigger role to play, and they said sadly no, they hadn't. Storm had no role to play. They could be a supportive role, which they are doing. They're going to um, numerous bodies and financial bodies and trying to get this here closed. And um, but no, the legislation last in Westminster, and they're doing as much as they can, and they appreciate um, our directors' assistance of, of um, data sharing going forward. So just a very beneficial meeting, but there's a lot of work to be done. Shane. Thank you, Councillor Fitzgerald. So it's been proposed and noted, and it is it's now uh, been proposed by Councillor McAdoff that we write to Branton Lewis, Secretary of State, seconded by Councillor Fitzgerald. Are we all agreed at that at this time? I know we have a, a range of other speakers wanting to come on, and I'll ask the speakers to keep their comments very brief. And Councillor McAleer, Emmett. Thank you, Chair. I would actually uh, advise that we we, you know, we've written to Brandon Lewis before, and we've got letters back from unaccountable or nameless or faceless civil servants or bodies. I would propose that we actually write directly to Boris Johnson in this instance. Uh, I wouldn't be as enthused by the the minister's letter, having read through it. He states that the that he had made the case last July or in July to pause bank closures. Um, the Finance Committee in Stormont passed a motion calling on banks to pause their closure plans, but less than a week later, AIB announced it was closing eight branches, including here in Oma. The AIB announcement came uh, a number of days after Danske Bank had announced its plans to close four of its branches, and obviously we had Bank of Ireland announcing plans in March to shut 15 of its branches here, um, including up in Stravan. You know, with all of that in mind, I we need to take this to the British government. We need to take it to the highest levels because it is an urgent matter. Uh, and seemingly, the, the the banks themselves pay very scant regard to Stormont, given the, the timing of their announcements uh, following on the statements from the minister and from the finance committee. So again, we need to put our, our, our money where our mouth is, so to speak, go to the highest levels because this is really a lifeline, as Councillor Michael Luff, uh, rightly said there whenever he was talking about the, the meetings that were held. It's about access to cash, and that is something that is particularly uh, necessary in a rural area like our own, and having to travel to from the lakes of Omar or rural Tyrone to go to Enniskillen to access uh, an AIB bank branch. It's just not feasible for a lot of people in our area, so we need to take a strong stance as possible. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Sure, Matthew Bell. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, firstly, I just kind of wanted to echo the comments made by Councillor Michael Duff. Um, we, the OMA councillors, have been meeting with, um, have had various meetings with different groups, um, and I'm and I'm glad that um, there's cross that all the parties in OMA are working together. But I do have a slightly different interpretation of the of of the letter we received from uh, Minister Murphy. Um, that uh, a different interpretation that Councillor Michael Duff had. Um, I have to say I'm a little disappointed from the response um, from Minister Murphy and his colleagues, Minister Hargy and Minister Lyons, um, as I don't believe their response was satisfactory to the issues we have raised. 
um, he seemed to pass the buck straight to Westminster. I know, and although he is correct in stating that regulation of the financial sector does lie in Westminster, I don't believe that the Northern Irish ministers for finance, the economy and communities, with all their influence over um, Northern Irish, cannot do more to support. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Okay. Councillor Stephen Donnelly. Sorry, Councillor Coffey. Sorry, you're jumping around there. Uh, thank Great. you, Chair. Yeah, I just um I, I would just uh, second the proposal from uh, Councillor McAleer, but I, I just wanted to um uh, add in another additional point, really, if he was willing to include it. The, the issue is really, um, and I note uh, it's complete absence of a reference to this in the, min uh, the letter from uh, the Minister for Finance. I'm very surprised actually that the Minister for Finance would miss such a, an important detail considering the All Ireland nature of it. But AIB is 71% owned by the Irish state. And I think that we need to take the battle for this to the Irish government, which owns AIB. Why is the Irish government allowing uh, AIB to close uh, bank services here in, in Fermanagh and Oma. And so I propose, if, if Councillor McAleer was willing, that we would include a letter to uh, the Taoiseach uh, around the issue of why uh, and how the Irish government can help our district by uh, mandating uh, a company in which it has a 71% stake uh, to actually ensure the provision of locally accessible banking services. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Coffey. Stephen, Councillor Stephen Donnelly. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. And uh, I would just like to place on record my thanks uh, to, to, to those involved in the organisation of those meetings, because I think it was useful for us to have the opportunity to make those representations and the opinions of people in OMA concerned about uh, this closure heard. I suppose the only thing that I would add is that one of the things that I was most concerned about um, particularly coming out of the meeting with the Financial Conduct Authority, is the indication that it seems as though intervention is something that would only be considered in the most severe of circumstances where um, the potential closure would result in the complete absence of any physical presence of financial services, which would literally be the worst case scenario, which is something that we do not want to get anywhere near. And even in that particular scenario, it would not even be guaranteed that there would be any success uh, in terms of potentially avoiding a, a closure. So I think that it is necessary that we do engage at the appropriate level and the highest levels uh, around ensuring that the UK government does provide the adequate focus that is necessary to the issue of retaining uh, the physical presence of financial uh, services in communities which are in need of those services, uh, because at present, under the current regulations, it does seem that rural communities and small county towns are without any significant protections in terms of avoiding closures of this nature. And I would just like to add that, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Donnelly. Councillor Seamus Green. Councillor Green. Yes, yes. That, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, I, I fully concur with that. Uh, um, almost everything that has been said and uh, I'd wish to uh, to back Barry's uh, proposal there. J just to add that when Listenski branch closed of Bank of Ireland uh, in Fermanagh, uh, Bank of Ireland left uh, Fermanagh, the most rural county, uh, with just one branch open and that's in Enniskillen. It's the only one of the six counties that Bank of Ireland has only one branch open. And it's it's open from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And it takes an hour from half 12 to half one as well. This is supposed to be to accommodate the whole of Fermanagh. Uh, and it's open basically uh, five hours a day. Closed on Saturday, closed on Sunday. and. That's what we're left with with Bank of Ireland. And I foresee that all of these banks are going digital. Uh, I can see Bank of Ireland and Anna Skillen, uh, uh, uh heading toward closure as well. Uh, when a bank is open from 10 a.m. in the morning to 4 p.m. and close for an hour at lunch, as the only branch in the county, 
you can see where they are going. And that's not uh, to accommodate customers uh, personally. Uh, they're going online and it's just pure greed and uh, people really should reconsider where they're buying. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Councillor Green. Now, two speakers left on the subject, and please keep your comments brief. And that is Councillor Josephine Dehan. Thank you, Chair. Well, Chair, I, I think it is appropriate that we as a council would devote a lot of time to this topic uh, where we are uh, exceptionally concerned at this development. Sadly, when we met with AIB senior officials on the 14th of September, we met with Brian Gillen and Seamus McGuckin. And unfortunately, the message they sent out to us at that meeting was that this change uh, was irreversible. Uh, they seem to be quite clear in that uh, and uh, from the information they gave us, you know, uh, citing changes in customer behaviour, less footfall to banks, more digital operations and the low interest rate environment that prevails currently. It was clear to me that their bottom line was just purely financial considerations. And to me, that is very disappointing, given the extent to which the banks themselves were bailed out during the financial crash. Uh, to my mind, they are simply not discharging their social responsibilities. And uh, I think any measure that we can take to highlight the issue and put pressure on AIB and other banks to reverse this decision, it's these are steps that we need to take. And so I support these proposals, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Dehan. And the last speaker on this issue is Councillor Eamon Keenan. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, well, fully support the proposal. And as uh, Councillor Dehan has just said, uh, these very banks were bailed out by the, by the people, and this, this bank in particular, a 71% share of the Irish government, it needs, to, it needs to be accountable. And I'll just give you a quote for the Financial Services Union. What they're saying, what the banks are doing at the minute during COVID, closing them, a scandalous dereliction of, of its societal role. We feel that the banks have taken advantage of the pandemic, particularly communities. Adherence to government guidelines of COVID to justify closure on the grounds of reduced footfall. So that the, they, they've used COVID, they've used the pandemic to increase profits and in turn to... Uh, I suppose shirk off the the very people that bailed them out after the last crisis, and that yes, definitely should be challenged. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that brings that to a close. And can I just say, first of all, that I was involved in two of those meetings and chairing them, and as a normal councillor, they were beneficial to us. But we didn't. We at the same time, we didn't hear what we needed to hear, and uh, unfortunately, I had to make an apology for yesterday's meeting. So. Uh, First of all, we have two proposals on the table. Uh, Councillor McAleer, are you happy with your proposal that Councillor Coffey said that we should include in the correspondence the Taoiseach? Chair, yeah, I was just on the hidden there. Yeah, absolutely happy to include that. It's a great point. Thank you. Okay, and I, I go to Councillor McAdoff, who made the original proposal, and second about Councillor Fitzgerald. Are you I'll let you comment for yourself, Councillor McAlduff. I'd be very happy to incorporate uh, that proposal, no problem. Uh, Councillor Coffey made a very good point about the Irish government role in this matter, and Councillor McAleer's point about including Boris Johnson in the correspondence, absolutely, very relevant. And just maybe finally to say that this council would need to, uh, if this is unsuccessful, if it is, and we don't want it to be, then we're left with another vacated site at High Street Noma, an iconic building, need to factor that in but but obviously we're in challenge mode and we, we want to challenge this to the last thank you chair absolutely agree with you uh councillor McAdoff, and we obviously have to be thinking of our other banking facilities in, in our in our town of Oma here the county town of tyrone and and other other issues that may be pertinent out there as well so you're happy enough to include basically the two proposals as have been outlined are we all agreed councillors Okay, thank you for your cooperation. Uh, page 12, page 13, 
page 14, page 15, page 16, page 17, page 18, Chief Executive. Thank you, Chair. Just to refer members to the correspondence received from Post Office Counters Limited in relation to the Council's uh, representations regarding the closure of the Enniskillen branch. And the, um, well, the letter states that they recognise the urgency and seriousness of the situation. Uh, sorry, the Chair should have advised this in the other folder. Um, but obviously there, there is no update or certainly nothing formally uh, provided by way of update in the letter received. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Thornton, Howard Thornton. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm quite happy to propose noting. Thank you. But, but with regard to it, I mean, it seems ironic that we're not getting any response other than before Christmas, and hopefully that's this year. Uh, but obviously the business community have been informed otherwise, and I'm not going to speculate as to what they have been told. But again, this is an ongoing problem and we need to be kept up to date. But I'm quite happy to propose noting. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Thornton, for that. Uh, Councillor Donald Coffey. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'm happy uh, to second the noting of this document. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's, it's quite a confusion, a response. It states that it's temporary and I do note what Councillor Thornton just said there, which is hopefully it's temporary and a reopening this Christmas uh, coming. Uh, but there's no guarantees of that. I note the letter also gives two reasons for closure, and you'd have to suspect oh, one of the two is not a primary reason. So whether it's, uh, is it either uh, the resignation of a postmaster or the withdrawal of pre premises? And uh, I think that there's a lot of unanswered questions and we're gonna have to keep uh, digging for answers. This is completely unacceptable. People are uh, reliant on the post office in the middle of our county town, and uh, we've got continued failure to do anything about the closure. So it's, um, we're just gonna have to keep fighting on this. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Council Coffey, so it's been proposed and seconded for noting. Going on with page 18 and page 19. Few members. Moving on to item six. And it's uh, to confirm the minutes of the Environmental Services Committee meeting held on the 6th of September 2021 and as paper C. For accuracy. Page one. Councillor McAleer, Emmett. Thanks, Chair, and thank you for getting my name right. Unfortunately, on page one of the document here, I'm recorded as Emmett McLee. So um, if I could get that recorded or corrected as a matter of accuracy, I'd be appreciated. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for letting us know that'll be corrected. Page two. Page three. Page four. Page five. Page six. Page seven. Page eight. Page nine. Page 10, page 11, page 12, and page 13. And I go to Councillor Mark Buchanan to propose the adoption. Happy to propose the adoption, Chair. Chair of Committee. Have a seconder. Chair, I second that. Robert Irvine, just wait out. Yeah, I'll second that, Chair. Seconded by Councillor Robert Irvine, and all agreed. Thank you. Moving on to item seven, and as to confirm the minutes of the Regeneration and Community Committee meeting held on the 14th of September, 2021, and as paper D for accuracy. Page one, page two, page three, page four, page five, page six, Sir Donald Coffey, page six. Yeah, thank you, Chair. It's uh, page five I was back on. Um, it was Aye. in relation to the uh, resolution there, uh, middle of the page. Um, it's, it doesn't specify point number three, which is where I think it should fall. Uh, the uh, entire my contribution or and uh, was really around the future proofing of homes to incorporation of energy efficiency measures and alternative 
on alternative heating sources in particular i would like to see in there the word in particular uh wood sources thank you chair i i i it was the whole point was that we were discussing how we could potentially accommodate clean burning of wood technologies thank you chair okay thank you for that council coffee i'm sure that'll be uh uh, corrected as necessary. Thank you. Page seven. Page eight. Page nine. Page ten. Page eleven. Page twelve. Page thirteen. Page fourteen. Page fifteen. Page sixteen. Page seventeen. Page 18, page 19, page 20, and page 21. We go now to the chair of the committee and his councillor, Victor Warrington. I'll propose, chair. Thank you. Post adoption. Thank you. Second, I'll second chair. Second, Josephine, uh, Josephine Dehan. All agreed. Thank you. Moving on to item 8. As to confirm the minutes of the Regeneration and Community Committee, no, sorry, confirm the meeting minutes of the Policy and Resources Committee meeting held on the 15th of September 2021, and it's paper E. Councillor Diane Armstrong. Apologies. Apologies. I need to lower my hand. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're starting off in PR again. Page one, page two, page three, page four, page five, page six, page seven, page eight, page nine, page ten, page eleven, page twelve. It's 13, it's 14, it's 15, it's 16, and page 17. I go to Councillor Howard Thornton, Chair of the Committee, to propose it for the adoption. I propose adoption, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Thornton. Have you a seconder? Uh, Councillor Mary Gardy. Second, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. All agreed? Thank you. Okay, on to item nine, and it's to confirm minutes of Brexit Committee meeting held on the 20th of September, 2021, paper F for accuracy. Page one, page two, page three, page four, page five. I go to the chair of the committee, Councillor Anthony Feely, for the adoption of the minutes. Yes, yes, yes I'll, propose, I'll propose it out. Thank you. Councillor Philly, of your seconder. Councillor McGuire. Uh, happy to second that, currently. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McGuire. Opposed and second. All agreed. Thank you. Okay, moving on now to uh, page 10, or sorry, item 10, to confirm the uh, minutes of the planning committee meeting held on the 22nd of September 2021, and it's paper G for accuracy. Page 1, page 2, page 3, page 4, page 5, page 6. Page seven, page eight, page nine, page ten, page eleven, page twelve, page thirteen, page fourteen, page fifteen, page sixteen, page seventeen, and page eighteen. Go now to the chair of the planning committee. Mr. Tommy McGuire, the adoption. Is 
So Councillor Campbell was absent on that particular day. Uh, he's absent of safety, sorry. Uh, Councillor McGuire, sorry. Yeah, I, I took the pro tem chair on the evening uh, in question. Chair, I'm happy to propose the minutes. Thank you very much. I'll second, Chair. Josephine Robert Deacon. Uh, happy to second, Chair. Thank okay. you. Okay, uh, supported by Councillor Deacon. Thank you. And we're all agreed. Okay, on now to item 11. It's to confirm the minutes of the reconvened planning committee meeting held on the 28th of September 2021. And it's paper H. For accuracy. Page 1. Page 2. It's 3. Page 4. Page 5. Okay, I'll go down and put your cables missing or absent this evening. So I'll go now to Councillor Garrity. Hold on, I'll just get the on here. Or the adoption. Yeah, just to propose it, Terry. Thank you. Propose the adoption. Thank you, Councillor Garrity. Councillor Paul Robinson. You second that. Seconded. Opposed and seconded. All agreed. Thank you. And now on to item 12. Uh, Chief Executive, and to consider delegation of council powers to the following committee in October 2021, and it's environmental services. I'll let the Chief Executive come in here. Well, Chair, it's just really to advise that because these matters are outside of the terms of reference, the normal terms of reference of the committee, council powers be required, and this is to ensure that the uh, submissions are made in advance of the closing date. So that would be to tomorrow evening's uh, Environmental Services Committee. Thank you very much, Chief Executive. Mr. Robert Irving. Thank you, Chair. Happy to propose the delegation of power in respect to these two consultations to EES tomorrow night. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Irving. Mr. Paul Robinson. I second that. Thank you, Councillor Robinson. And all agreed. Thank you. Now we are on to item 13 as correspondence. 13.1 uh, is to consider the following items of correspondence from the Lord and Ireland Office. Number one, uh, Chief Executive. Chair, item 13.1 uh, is in relation to the Council's, uh, sorry, it's a response we had written to the Secretary of State. We've received response from the Legacy Group in the Northern Ireland Office and the Council had expressed its concerns regarding the proposed reforms to the various legacy processes. Um, so the, the response really summarises the government's position and refers to the publication of the command paper in July of this year. Councillor Bernice Swift. Yes, uh, Gur Maggot, uh, and thank you, Alison, for uh, giving your synopsis there. Um, once again, uh, this is just uh, not nearly a good enough response uh, to our council area, and um, particularly as this letter has outlined uh, why obtaining information might be the solution um, by full disclosure by the state. Um, nobody believes that that would, be hap that would happen and be a reality. And indeed, right across the victim sector, they have been uh, wholly, wholly annoyed and just disgusted at the response. So I would be proposing that we not just really nearly forget about um, Brandon Lewis now at this stage. Uh, contact, it has to be Boris Johnson, because I did even hear him on the television myself last night. This is the mother of all cover-ups for all, all victims right across the sector. It, it really is a very bad response. Mm -hmm. It has been breathtaking and it's rather vindictive uh, proposals. We know that uh, at the very highest levels um, through uh, RUC and British Army, there have been major cover-ups to prevent truth and justice happening. So 
to suggest that this might be a response is not good enough. As far back as the Haas talks, of which, as, which I was involved in, um, it was decided an international response was what was required at this stage. So at this point, I am suggesting forget about these unsigned letters from Brandon Lewis and his department, the NIO. Let's get in touch with number 10 and ask Boris Johnson to make the proper response here and let him know firmly and clearly that our constituency base have been outraged at this response. It's it's not good enough on any level. And we have been writing and writing as far back as last July. So, you know, there really needs to be a definitive response to dealing with the legacy of the past. And this is not the route to go. Garamagat. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Swift, you made that a proposal. That yes. To the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. Yes, uh, please. Next up, we have Councillor Siobhan Curry. Yes, Gurmagada Kairi. Um, yeah, I think that um, the Tory government need to listen to the voices of victims um, and particularly coming after the comments from um, the British Secretary of State about legislation for an amnesty for British state forces. Once again, it's laid bare uh, what victims know that is that the British government will put uh, British state forces above the law and above the needs of victims and they can't be placed above the rule of law and accountability and um, you know our party is strong on this v victims of the conflict and their families cannot be denied access to the courts in the pursuit of truth and justice so uh, very happy to second uh, Courier Swift's proposal there. They should withdraw their controversial amnesty proposals for state forces outlined in the uh, command paper on the 14th of July and instead commit fully to implementing the Stormont House Agreement in a human rights compliant manner. Gurmogat. Thank you very much, Councillor Curry. So you have seconded Councillor Swift's proposal. That letter goes now to the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, MP. Are we all agreed? Not sensing any dis dissension in, in the chamber or outside of it. Councillor Swift, take your hand down, please. Thank you. Okay, it's passed. Uh, Chief Executive. Second item. Yes, thank you, Chair. So this, uh, the second letter from the Northern Ireland Office refers to what's being described as a moment of reflection, which is a plan from the UK government to illuminate buildings across the UK on Friday, the 22nd of October, as part of the Northern Ireland Centenary Programme. So the details are, are set out in the letter, Chair, regarding the proposed illumination arrangements, and the Council would have to notify the Northern Ireland Office by the 8th of October if we wish to participate in confirming the buildings uh, which would be part of those illuminations. Okay, councillors, you've heard the, the letter read from the Lord and Davos uh, by the Chief Executive. First speaker is Councillor Deborah Erskine. Keeping it up here, Deborah. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I, I understand, you know, we have already lit up our buildings um, and that took place in May. However, I do see that this is a collective way in which all councils across Northern Ireland um, are planning to light up buildings. I note that in the letter it says that this is for reflection, hope, inspiration. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a way of recognising the enduring contribution to civic and cultural life and, and things like that that has taken place in Northern Ireland over the last 100 years. Um, I know that people will differ, but I think it is a moment for us to reflect on our history, um, on our past, about moving forward. And so I would like to propose that we do light up the council buildings, um, like what will be happening perhaps in other council areas as well. And hopefully we can be mature in our conversation around the centenary. Um, we will differ on how we we look at it, but I think it is a moment for us to all collectively um, take take forward our hopes, um, our aims for the future, um, and hopefully we can all agree 
on this going forward tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Erskine. Next up is Councillor Paul Robinson. Thank you, Chair. I agree with all of my colleagues said, and I'll second the proposal. Okay, it's proposed and seconded. And next up in the chamber is Councillor Tommy McGuire. I agree with Councillor Carley. Well, uh, uh, we have indeed worked locally here on the reflections of the last hundred years, and I think within the council we have uh, voiced our opinions uh, from both sides of the discussion, I suppose you could say. But uh, I think that this proposal, given that it's coming from the UK government, that it's not even from within our own people, uh, I, I would have to say that I, I don't agree with this proposal. And I propose that uh, we note the letter and, and move on. Uh, I do note on a technical issue that it, it is requesting that we mark our, our buildings with two colours. Uh, I'm aware technically we are unable to do that. So. Uh, on that basis alone, uh, I'd be happy enough to reject this letter. But uh, as I say, we have locally engaged in discussions through the committees of the, the council and, and, and worked out our own differences uh, on those issues. But I think this coming from the UK government, who uh, has uh, certainly nothing to offer to the people that, uh, uh, that I represent over the last 100 years, the history has been one of, of hardship and discrimination. But thankfully, we're working our ways through that, and the future is looking a lot brighter from my perspective. Honey. But uh, I don't think that the council should be engaged in this action. I make that proposal, Chair Thank you, Councillor McGuire. And there are other ones coming in from outside the chamber here. And it's Councillor Alex Baird. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, it's fortuitous that people in the chamber have their foot on the door. Uh, because uh, this was something I was going to propose uh, that we go ahead with. Um, we have our decade of anniversaries group, and it's unfortunate that this, with the timing, that this couldn't be considered at that group. I'm, I'm disappointed, I must say, in Councillor Maguire's uh, line that he has taken in this. I would have thought we should have had some maturity and a spirit of mutual respect in the context of this. If you go to paragraph three there, uh, on the NIO letter, there's nothing triumphalist or anything else about it. Uh, it says we aim to create a unique moment of reflection, hope and inspiration alongside public recognition of the enduring contribution of civic and cultural life on all the buildings involved. It's unfortunate that we're going to split in this. I would have thought either magnanimity or mutual respect would have been the order of the day, but possibly not. I would certainly support that we do it because it's a threat to no one. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Baird. Next up is Councillor Diana Armstrong. Diana. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. And I'd like to also speak in support of this and um, to support my colleague, Councillor Baird, particularly um, I'm drawn to the enduring contribution to civic and culture and life of all the buildings involved to be illuminated. And, and you know, it is a measure of the success of, of how we have worked together to create a balanced civic society. Um, particularly using these civic and cultural buildings that we have in our district. And I would propose that we light up our uh, town hall and Grange buildings in our district to, um, as a reflection of how we are working together to move forward in society. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Next up, Councillor Brady Swift. Armagat, Kihirlok, yes. And um, no, I totally refute this correspondence coming in from the NIO. Uh, never mind the insensitivities of it all, considering uh, what the centenary represented for a lot of our citizens. I am totally opposed to any lighting up of buildings and talking about our story in the making. It would be much better if they would shine a light on the real story that happened throughout the centenary. And I'm talking about the, I suppose, the outworkings of partition, the causes, nature and extent of the oppression, discrimination and blatant inequality suffered by many, uh, especially who lived in our area. And indeed, a uh, motion that's tabled later on, the murder of citizens is, has been the most experience of a lot of people in this centenary. Uh, thankfully, there, it, we won't have to look at celebrating it in another hundred years, not that we're going to be around anyway. But I think the story in the making is forget about this. This is not sensitive and it's just 
um, totally, totally against the wishes of certainly the people I represent. And I take exception with some of the language used about uh, uh, councillors demonstrating maturity. We represent the people who democratically elect us, and that's our maturity. Thank you, Councillor Swift. Next up, Councillor Chris McCaffrey. Carmagat Akahali and I would um, agree with some of the sentiments that have been expressed um, by Councillor Swift and I just want at this stage formally um, second Councillor McGuire's proposal. Um, this is something we can't support. Any self-respect and nationalist the Republican cannot support the partition of the island of Ireland. It was a completely detrimental event to um, the people in, in Fermanagh um, of, uh, who lived across the border. Um, the Irish identity was oppressed. Um, our people were discriminated against in terms of housing, education and employment. And it went on for decades. There was a one party orange state. There was a police state and um, nothing about partition is positive. And I think it is really uh, coming from the British government. It's um, a political maneuver and um, one that we cannot support and one that I know the people I represent certainly would not support. So I think in the interest of uh, pluralism and, and showing respect for others, asking people to be part of a commemoration of something that actually did damage to um, our identity as as, uh, as Irish people um, is something that's just ridiculous, to be honest. So I would just say a second Councillor McGuire's proposal that this does not go ahead. Gormila Okay, thank you, Councillor McCaffrey. To your seconding Councillor McGuire's proposal. Uh, next up, we have Councillor Eamon Keenan. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, well, I, I would oppose the motion to uh, to go ahead with lighting up these buildings and, and fully support um, Councillor McGuire's proposal. Partition, in my view, was wrong, and as many have stated here, it caused nothing but uh, oppression, and it's left us in a state where we're only, the only thing that's really successfully survived and thrived is sectarianism, and uh, the, the fact that light, lighting up civic buildings seems as though it's, it's okay. But many Irish people uh, were sentenced to, to death in civic buildings and courthouses and sent to, to lifetimes in jails. So definitely I would not support it at all. Thank you, Councillor Keenan. Councillor Seamus Green. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Yeah, I would like to support uh, Councillor McGuire's proposal to uh, note this and just move on. If Boris Johnson thinks that anyone that I represent is inspired by a hundred years of prohibition, he's just, uh, he is just deluded. And I think if we look at his record, we do all understand that this man is delusional. And uh, so I, I, I agree we move on from this. And uh, Councillor Keith Elliott. Yes, thank you, Chair. Well, I'll just like to support the uh, Councillor Erskine, my party colleague, and what she'd said here today. And listening to some of the comments that have been made now, it's disappointing. But you know, people need to be reminded of uh, what benefit they got during COVID as a result of being part of the UK. Thanks for that, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Elliot. Councillor Thomas O'Reilly. Thank you, Chair. I just want to come in in support of, of Tommy's proposal, and I think it's somewhat ironic that we should be getting a proposal coming out of London uh, to light up buildings, uh, bearing in mind that for many, many decades, the lighting up of buildings was the burning of nationalist houses. And uh, I think that we uh, should see this for what it is. Uh, absolutely nothing to unify people, but something to uh, be totally objected to. And I think that uh, to say that we should be grateful for what we got through COVID uh, from the UK government, I think the government that is there have a duty to uh, be able to protect the people that are uh, here and with nothing else but the very minimum that we are getting and certainly the the COVID uh, compounded with Brexit has brought us nothing but hardship. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Reilly. Councillor Catherine Kelly, last speaker. Uh, thanks, Chair. 
I, I look, I understand this is a, a divisive issue, um, but I have to concur with my party colleagues and uh, support uh, Thomas Maguire's comments. A uh, partition did nothing for my constituents. It brought hardship, it brought emigration, it brought, brought lost sons and daughters, and, uh, uh, and uh, there's nothing to celebrate for my community. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, I'm sure Catherine Kelly. Okay, I'm obviously sensing a division here, and I, I, I don't. There's two more speakers coming on here now. These are a bit later, uh, chaps, but we'll let you in. I'm sure Emmett McAleer. Thanks, Chair, and I'll, I'll be very brief, but I, I wasn't going to speak, but it's in response to, I think it was Councillor Elliott made the point there about what we what we got from the the uk government um what we got was uh, a reckless move by boris johnson and his associates to drive herd immunity it was only through the actions of local people and local families who kept children off school and who actually took the lead that actually caused the lockdown in the first place whilst they were happy to kill as many people as possible that they thought they could do without we got over a hundred thousand dead we have the nhs system on its knees and being sold off to private funds and and touted to private interests you know we have nothing beneficial whatsoever from the tory party and their associates who are you know given multi-million and billion pound contracts to their friends and family members uh it, it's an absolutely disgraceful comment and to think that anything good or beneficial has come from any association with with the London government over the last 12 or 18 months, I think is it takes a lot of believing or a lot of stretching of the imagination to to have that in any way realistic. So I think that just needed to be put on record, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McAleer. Mr. Robert Irving. Thank you very much, Chair. I was letting my party colleagues take a lead on this, but I cannot agree with some of the comments that Councillor McAleer has come up with. Um, if I read him right and listened to him, he's accusing the Tory government of mass murder. Uh, I'm sorry, I cannot be associated with comments like that. He either withdraws them or he makes them personal. They are not comments coming from the chamber, and I will not be recorded as agreeing with them. Uh, I think this matter should not have been divisive, but it has become, and unfortunately some people are completely using language that is totally uncalled for in what is supposed to be now a shared and open community going forward. So withdraw your comments. Thank you for that, uh, Councillor Irvine. I, I said at the beginning of the meeting that the meeting should be conducted with respect, and basically having manners. Now, there have been some comments that have been made here this evening uh, that have been went beyond the pale. Uh, Councillor McAleer, I allow you to answer Councillor Irvine. Yes, sir. Um, um, don't feel I've crossed any lines. I'd like to know what specifically he has objection to, because a lot of it is public knowledge and publicly documented. Indeed, from Boris Johnson's right hand man, Don and Cummings. So I'd like to know what exactly he has taken issue with, or is like he putting say, words in my mouth? Sorry, Councillor McAleer, don't talk when I'm talking. Uh, can I just say that we're not going to be taking any lessons from Mr. Cummings and in, in this chamber? And we will have a constructive and debate on these issues. We don't need to be rubbing uh, anybody's nose in, in the dirt or calling anybody anything. So we can have a, a constructive and respectful debate. We may not agree on a lot of things, but let's keep it respectful. Councillor Matthew Bell. Yes, Chair, I'll keep my comment very brief, as a lot's already been said in this. Um, I was born in 99 um, after the Good Friday Agreement and what's been hammered home into my generation is that we should have respect for each other, we should have integrity in our politics and that we live in a, in a, in a divided community but we're working to move forward together. Um, this motion ha has been very careful or this proposal has been very carefully worded to not sound triumphant and to not cause hurt um, for a certain the communities in Northern Ireland which mightn't support it. Um, this is just an opportunity 
to reflect on our shared 100 years because although some people in this chamber don't like the fact that maybe the fact that Northern Ireland even exists, the fact remains um, we have had 100 years of shared history and I think it's an excellent opportunity to reflect um, on those 100 years and, um, and take it as an opportunity to move forward with better community relations. Thank you. Mr. Bell, Mr. Victor Warrington, definitely last speaker. I'm not going to make really much in the comment. I just agree with uh, obviously my colleagues in the previous uh, sentiments and agree with your own comment uh, about not taking uh, anything from what Cummings says. Uh, he's obviously a very sore individual. Just to say, this is obviously going to a vote. And I certainly would be very skeptical of us using the voting system again. I think. To be fair to everybody, there is no doubt that the first vote we took tonight was not accurate. And with the fact that there were so many people who didn't vote, uh, didn't you know if they'd abstained, okay. But the ones that didn't vote shows to me they weren't okay with the system. And I certainly would say we should either go to a recorded vote or go to a paper vote. Thank you. Well, thank you for your comments, uh, Mr. Warrington. Now, Councillor Feely, I'm not letting you in because I said you were, it was the last speaker. There's no call to be rehearsing at all again. And no, I just want to agree with Victor there. Just agree with Victor okay. with Colton. Councillor McGuire, very quick. Uh, Graham, good. Uh, Chair, just a point of information. I think my proposal was that we note it and move on. Uh, just if we could get clarification then, uh, understanding orders, once you get a proposal to move on and a seconder, which I believe I had. Uh, does that not override the, the position of a vote? Uh, uh, just for clarification from the Chief Executive, please. Chair, sure. Yes, if it was presented under that standing order that, that we move to the next business, that, that would be correct. That would take precedence in those circumstances, Chair. Okay. Mr. Miller, hold on, I'll get you in here. Uh, so, so chair, and thanks for that clarification, Chief Executive. So, on on that point of of standing orders, my proposal was to note and to move on, and it was formally seconded, Chair. So, uh, I'll abide by your decision, Guru Magat, Chair. I think. Right, from from memory, Councillor. Thanks for that, Councillor. From memory, I think you said to note the correspondence. Uh, I don't think you said to move on, but uh, and there there was a seconder for that. However, we have uh, maybe a bit of obviously division in the chamber. So I think, uh, in fairness to all, we will have a vote on it. And that will uh, that'll rule it out one way or the other. And uh, for, for, the, for the benefit of all, I am now going to take a five-minute recess so that we can again instruct all councillors on the way to vote. Thank you.
first thing we'll be going to, is, and we'll all be able to vote. You all know how to do it now. So we'll be voting on Councillor Erskine's proposal, and that was seconded by Councillor Robinson, and that's the first proposal that we light up the buildings. We're just waiting for IT to get back and leave. Yeah, okay. Should be able to go now. Okay, for those joining in, the vote has now commenced on Councillor Erskine's proposal, seconded by Councillor Paul Robbins. So just a reminder to hit submit after your selection. Perfect. Councillor Wilson just needs to vote and submit. Okay, I'm going to bring the Chief Executive in and to clarify the situation with regard to the vote now. Okay, Chair, so just to confirm um, that in terms of Councillor Erskine's proposal, 12 voted for, 12 members for, 15 against, and one abstention. So that proposal falls. Okay, thank you, Chief Executive. We now go to, we now go to Councillor McGuire's proposal. And the initial proposal from memory was that we note the correspondence and that was seconded. So we're going to go to that vote again. So the vote has now been set up. So I'm going to go for that now. Okay. Vote now. Councillor Clark, if we can just make a select check. Councillor Bell just had some met. Just a reminder, Councillor Clark, to make a selection, hit submit. Okay, thank you to AT, and I bring a chief executive in. So just then, in terms of Councillor Maguire's proposal, Chair, we had 17 votes for, nine votes against, and one not voting. So that has carried. Okay, that's carried. And can I just thank uh, everyone for the cooperation there? It's a long drawn out process, and uh, thanks thanks to Damien and Adam and the team for trying to Chairman, just a, a point. Uh, so really? Thomas here. Uh, Chair, why are we not seeing the results of those votes? Uh, I, can we not get IT to be able to bring up the, the results of the vote? This just 
you know, we're back then to somebody reading out a, a result. Why are we not seeing them the same as the uh, test? It, Chair, because when we reported this, first of all, we highlighted we're working two different systems. So the test that was undertaken was only the WebEx voting. So you saw the WebEx record. There is a, dist a different system in place in the chamber and there is no ability to uh, display the two different systems of voting. Cheers, Alison. Thank you. OK. Hey. OK, councillors, that concludes the, the correspondence. Uh, we are now... I can find my place here. We're moving on now to part two business. And I've... Okay. Chair, I can't get on. The uh, voting uh, pattern is still on my uh, screen. Uh, plus, the, uh, the just saying the poll has ended, but uh, there's no uh, my name or any councillor's name is not available to me. Okay, that'll be sorted out by by Adam. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to uh, part two business. Can I have a proposal and seconder? We're going to committee. Proposed, kindly. Hold on. Mr. Chairman. Proposed, Chair. We're going to confidential business.
Thank you. Uh, now I'm going to ask the Chief Executive to give a resume of what took place while in confidential business. Thank you, Chair. While in confidential business, the uh, Council confirmed and signed the confidential minutes of the Council meeting held on the 7th of September. There were no matters arising from those minutes and also confirmed the confidential minutes of the Environmental Services Committee held on the 8th of September and the confidential minutes of the Policy and Resources Committee held on the 15th of September. Council also received an update in relation to a legal matter and agreed uh, its uh, proposed recommendation in relation to that matter, Chair, regarding participation. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Executive. Can we have a proposer and seconder that that's what took place? Councillor Robert Irvine and Councillor Deborah Erskine. All agreed? Thank agreed, you. Chair. Thank you. Okay, moving on to uh, our next business, and it's uh, item 14, and it's notices of motion. Can I just say at the outset, uh, there are four there are four motions. We, it is now almost 25 past nine, and we have to 10 o'clock. We'll see how we get on with this. Uh, I have, with, with regard to any motion that comes to this council, I have seeked, I have seeked uh, le legal clarification and also chief executive clarification with regard to standing orders. And all, all, is, all is as it is. And uh, there'll be no further discussion on these matters. So, first of all, 14.1, and the first motion is wealth tax. Now, I'd ask, and it's been proposed by Councillor Eamon Keenan, seconded by Councillor Donald O'Coffey, and I would ask uh, that you do not read your motion. It's quite clear, it's in black and white in front of everyone. So, just uh, condense your comments and please be mindful and respectful with your comments. Councillor Keenan. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, well, you have five minutes. Thank you. As my motion states, um, it's calling for the Sovereign Executive to oppose the 1.25% national insurance raise instead request the government to implement a wealth tax. And in the last year, the Tory government scrapped recently announced. Councillor Keenan. We're frozen. Yeah. Please turn off your camera. Thank you. Can you hear me there now? Carry on. Start again from your from the outset. Yeah, yeah. so uh, as my motion states, that this council is calling on the Stormont Executive to oppose the 1.25% national insurance raise and to instead request that the British government to implement a wealth tax. And in turn, we're calling Boris Johnson and the Tory government to scrap the recently announced. 1.25% uh, tax increase and for it to be replaced by the wealth tax to cover the cost of the NHS and social care. Um, I'm not going to read out the full motion, but uh, I'd like to call on all members tonight to support this motion as this is an issue that affects everyone in the community and it's an extra cost that many people in our community simply cannot afford to pay. I believe this tax is an attack on the working class people. As my motion states, many of the millionaires and billionaires use loopholes in the tax system to either pay less tax than the lowest earners or no tax at all. Many people would say that this tax system is flawed, but I would say that this system is not flawed. It is designed by the rich for the rich, and this new tax is just another element to further increase the taxation burden on the working class people, and the government is using it to cover of a worldwide pandemic to make this possible. During COVID, the poor have got poorer and the rich have got richer. There are now more millionaires than there were before COVID, and, and millionaires have, have become billionaires. And as the recently released Pandora Papers have proved that these people are playing the system very, very well. This tax needs to be challenged and fought, and fought strongly, and redirected to the most wealthy people. So again, I'd like to ask members for the support in this motion. Let's lead the way and fight for our communities and fight for the working class. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Keenan. And uh, now, over to your seconder, and Councillor Donald Coffey. Councillor Coffey, you have three minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, I'm happy to second this uh, motion. Uh, I think it is it hits on a very important issue uh, for working class people. Uh, the increase in national insurance is an additional tax on working class uh, incomes. Uh, it represents uh, an after tax uh, deduction of around 1.25%. And uh, that that will be uh, a cumulative impact right across workers. Uh, it hits. It's a regressive tax, 
it means that um that, that because it's capped NI uh, national insurance contributions are actually capped for high earning individuals so the bulk of the weight of this will fall on those who are uh, actually in work and suffering from poverty so uh, this is a very regressive move by the Tories uh, instead of taking on uh, the wealthy instead of uh, a, a taking on uh, those sectors of our economy which are producing wealth for profit for shareholders for bondholders for coupon clippers uh, and and of course that's the Tory agenda so we, we need to see uh, Stormont uh, taking a decisive line in opposition to this uh, we are saying that uh, the billionaire class who have increased their number dramatically during the period of the COVID lockdown, who's seen in the UK their wealth uh, grow by around 24%, 25%. In uh, global terms, their wealth has grown by 58%. Uh, the amount of wealth, the richest individual in the UK, or an ex Russian citizen, has wealth of, uh, you know, his wealth increased by 7.2%. 2 billion in the last few years alone and and it's right across the board this is there's a massive shift of wealth to the to the elites to those who own uh, virtually all aspects of uh, the modern economy and working class people are at the main, uh, same time in the massive suffering as never before so uh, i i hope uh, we pass this and i urge workers to ensure that they get the 1.25% back that they ensure them and, and inoculate themselves from the 30% plus increase in energy costs and the rampant inflation by the organizing collectively through trade unions and actually forcing uh, concessions, because that's the way to do it. If Stormont is unable to stand up for the people, workers need to collectively organize themselves to achieve those objectives. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Just within the time, Councillor. Okay, other speakers? Speakers in this matter, Councillor Tommy McGuire. I go to Margaret Cahirley, uh, and uh, generally I have no problem with this uh, motion. Uh, just uh, some clarification on the front line, on the top line, it says the Council caused the Stormont Executive to oppose. I do believe that there was a motion brought before Stormont where all parties were opposed to the 1.25, so uh, it may be superfluous of that line in, but I'm quite happy with the content of it. The uh, understanding of uh, wealth taxation and the necessity for those that have millions and billions of wealth. Uh, and indeed, there was a program on the television last night which demonstrated the exorbitant wealth that's out there in the world. And indeed, it exposed a lot of the friends of these individuals, uh, a lot of them at the top of government in Westminster. And uh, it is shocking to see that exposed on the television international uh, uh, I forget the term for them but billionaires as opposed to even millionaires and those are the people that we need to be uh, exposing uh, their friendship with high places in government needs to be exposed it is it is there that the problem of the working class people and indeed a lot of the problems environmental issues and and the all that pertains to the capitalist system across the world. We're all aware of this. We don't need to be reminded of it every month in here. Uh, we know the politics of the world, but all we can do is do the best we can for the people we have in this area. I am quite happy that we support this. Uh, the 1.25 taxation, again, is levy levied at every single worker, as opposed to the, uh, the position that should be followed in that the multi-billionaires should be targeted and they should be paying their fair share as the poor workers on PAYE and indeed the poor people on benefits who are losing another £20 a week. Uh, we have certainly no problem in supporting this motion. Gurr Maggot, Chair. Thank you, Councillor McGuire. Next speaker is Councillor Howard Thornton. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, the Ulster Unionist Party believes that the increase in national insurance, as well as the removal of the triple lock on pensions, are an unfair taxation on all ordinary workers, their families and pensioners. Increased tax revenues should not be directed towards the most vulnerable in our society. However, this motion calls for a wealth tax as a more suitable means to raise tax revenues. Allegedly in the format proposed, this would raise £39 billion more than the raise in national insurance contributions alone. From the research I've carried out, this is very questionable. 
In 1990, about a dozen European countries had a wealth tax, but by 2019, all but four had eliminated the tax because of practical difficulties and costs associated with both design and enforcement. In fact, a former left-wing socialist Labour government wished to introduce a wealth tax some years ago, and the former British Chancellor Dennis Healy stated, we had committed ourselves to a wet wealth tax but in five years, I found it impossible to draft one which would yield enough revenue to be worth the administrative cost and political hassle. I also understand that Germany has also recently abandoned the idea of a wealth tax. Capital flight can be a knock on to any wealth tax. In 2006, an article in the Washington Post was entitled Old Money, New Money, Flee France and Its Wealth Tax. A prominent French economist stated the wealth tax earned the French government approximately $2.6 billion, but it cost the economy $125 billion in capital flight. Nothing can move faster than capital across the world, and it's already been mentioned about the Pandora Papers recently exposed. In 2011, the London School of Economics examined wealth taxes that were abandoned by the Labour Party. They concluded that there were lingering questions such as the impacts on personal saving and small business investment, consequences of capital flight, complexity of implement implementation and ability to raise predicted revenues. Our membership of the United Kingdom makes us part of the fifth largest economy on the planet and we in Northern Ireland received a subvention of £10 billion annually to help fund our public services. Without this... Okay, and more or less the increase in national insurance and pension trouble lock changes should be reviewed frequently and additional funds should be committed to ease the burden on, on the most vulnerable. We cannot support the motion with regard to the wealth tax. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Thornton. Next up is Councillor Josephine Dehan. Thank you, Chair. Well, Chair, I will be supporting this motion and I want to commend Councillor Keenan. Councillor O'Coffey for bringing it forward. Uh, this proposal to increase national insurance contributions by 1.25% uh, is very, very unjust and will create significant hardship for many of the most vulnerable members uh, of our society. Um, I acknowledge uh, the huge amount of money that has been spent by the government in uh, getting us through uh, the COVID pandemic. And we acknowledge the uh, long-term underfunding of the NHS, which has consequently been, uh, been greatly hampered in the work that it is trying to uh, carry out. So the money must come from somewhere, but I think that uh, uh, taxes should be increased on those who have ability to pay not on the most uh, vulnerable in our society. We live in a democracy, Chair, and I believe that the stability of any modern democracy depends on fair and equitable treatment of all its citizens and the protection of those most vulnerable. Uh, I listened with interest to the contribution uh, of uh, Councillor Thornton and he raises interesting uh, statistics in respect of the imposition of wealth tax and resulting capital flight. But I believe that it is not beyond uh, uh, the powers uh, of, of technology and modern drafting to draft ta uh, taxation legislation uh, that would uh, uh, appropriately tax those people who make billions and billions of pounds each year. And I think uh, that um, we should have a wealth tax and there should be other incentives uh, such as a well-trained workforce, workforce for encouraging uh, inward investment in our economy. So I'm happy to support the motion, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Dehan. Just within the time. Uh, Councillor Mark McKellen. Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to speak on this motion. We would be generally supportive of the motion. Now, we couldn't agree 100% with all of the detail contained therein. But let's be clear, the DUP do not support the increase in national insurance. 
the DUP MPs voted against the government's national insurance raise. Now, any government should always look towards their efficiencies and making the best use of the money it already has before ever asking hard-pressed taxpayers to pay more. The national insurance raise imposes a flat rate tax increase of 1.25% on all workers, even those earning as little as 9,000 per year. Now, we would have concerns about the viability of some of the proposals in the motion, but we are in support of the general idea that those who benefit the most should pay more. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Buchanan. I start. Mary Gardy, yes, the LP. Thank you very much, Chair, and I'll not repeat. Um, what has been said prior, it's a very self-explanatory motion, non-controversial as far as we're concerned. Yeah. And I want to thank Councillor Keenan and Councillor Kofi for bringing it to the Chamber this evening and to the Council uh, on WebEx, and we will be supporting the motion. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Gardy. Last speaker on this issue is Councillor Alec, Alex Baird. Mr. Baird. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. And um, like my colleague, uh, Councillor Thornton, who has very lucidly explained why uh, my party will vote against it. I will be voting against it. I would just like uh, clarity on a couple of points. So in the second paragraph, there is a reference to capital, C-A-P-I-T-O-L, games tax. Now, I'm wondering, is that a typo on behalf of the council staff or is it an error by the proposers? Uh, if it's an error by the proposers, I hope their command of maths is better than their command of English. Uh, and um, in the final paragraph, just wh uh, who's being written to uh, all other councils in, in the north of Ireland? Could we have clarity? Is that the other 10 councils in Northern Ireland? Or is Donegal included in that? Donegal being the most northerly point on the island of Ireland? Maybe the proposer or seconder would like to clarify those couple of points for me. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Baird. I'll ask the proposer and seconder maybe to clarify maybe that quick one there first. Uh, capital is a typo, but uh, the north of Ireland will exclude Donegal out of this one. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Councillor Keenan. Okay, I'm. Uh, I will now back back to you, Councillor Keenan, for a summarise. To summarise. Yeah, thank you, Chair. So, yeah, it's, it's good to hear uh, uh, support from um, mo most of the the members there. And um, I think it was Councillor Thornton uh, spoke of the difficulties of maybe implementing it. Uh, if, there, if there's a will, it can be implemented. If we don't pay our taxes, we go to jail. You know, if it, it's, it's only the fact of, of, of a will of implementing it. Um, that's all I have to say. I think I outlined it pretty, uh, fairly well before. Thank you. Hey, thank you. I don't. I think it's self-explanatory. There's a there's a bit of a division in the chamber here again, so I'm going to put this to the vote, and we'll go with it with the electronic voting again. So you know what the the proposal is, uh, with regard to the wealth tax as proposed by Councillor Eamon Keenan, and seconded by Councillor Donald O'Coffey. Okay, let's go. Okay, just a reminder to hit submit. And so, Calvin, you've made a selection, just need to submit. Yep. All cultures have now voted. Just tell it now. So, Chair, just to confirm, 21 members voted for, six members voted against, so that has been carried. Okay, motion has been carried. Thank you for the operation of all.
the vote is now ended. Moving on to, we have now quarter to ten. If they can be braced, I think. I think we'll get. Uh, there's some feedback. Are we okay? Yep. Okay. Thank you for succinct. We'll try and get through this. It's now nine forty five almost. So we're having a bit of feedback here. Okay, thanks. Hopefully that'll work out. The next motion is uh, fourteen point two and it's a DFA slash uh, PAC public inquiry on Dalradian and as proposed by Councillor McAleer, Councillor McAleer and seconded by Councillor Eamon Keenan and the proposer has five minutes and the seconder of three minutes, other speakers have three minutes and if you Chair, have your comments Councillor McAleer you don't need to read that long motion. Chair can I have my screen sorted out again? Please. Okay. No problem, Councillor Wilson. Good to go, Chair, yeah. Councillor McAleer, go. Thank you, yeah. Um, I suppose just being mindful that we did call a five-minute recess, so hopefully that will get added on to the end of the meeting. But I'll rifle through it here. Go ahead. Um, now that the public inquiry has been called by Minister Malin, the fear and worry out in my local community has absolutely increased. People are really worried. They're worried about our water, about our air, about pollution and sickness, about our children. Indeed, they worry for the future of our community. And they worry too about whether their elected representatives and public officials in Fermanagh and Oma District Council really care. They worry whether we are, we and their local authority take this issue seriously. You will have read the motion on the public inquiry that I proposed. It seeks nothing more than fair play and balance, and I hope it will be improve, approved unanimously. It's important the Council seek urgent clarification of the terms of reference so as to establish that these are adequate to the task of an, and inclusive of a rights-based approach. Everyone, including the Minister, acknowledges the unprecedented scale, complexity and environmental risk of Dal Radian's project. Not only is the proposal huge, several sub-elements of the Dal Radian proposal are massive on their own, with incalculable risk, a level of risk to the water, air, land and to the health and well-being of people. I'd like to add that the misrepresentation of the level of environmental risk from Dalradian's proposals in the company's advertising campaign through the local media is absolutely disgraceful. The developer has been facilitated over months and years with more than 100 meetings with statutory agencies, meetings with senior public officials, including permanent secretaries and with ministers. As we move to the public inquiry, there's a burden of responsibility on this council as a local authority to uphold the public good the health and well-being of our citizens and the pristine condition of our Sparrow's area of outstanding natural beauty. Therefore, this motion calls for fair play, a balanced opportunity for local people to make their case for our children's health and well-being, for clean air, fresh water and unpolluted land, for a place where farming and sustainable tourism can both survive and thrive. Dalradian has the financial backing of international big mining. Local people must be given a fair hearing. A vast amount of public money has been spent enabling Dalradian to prepare its proposals. It is right and fitting, fair and proper, that local protectors of people's health and the environment are afforded an equal and proper opportunity to state their case. It is a matter of fair play and of justice that those bringing the public concerns on the Dalradian planning applications to the public inquiry are provided with the resources to bring an independent technical and scientific expertise to address the more complex aspects of these environmentally high-risk proposals. I propose the motion. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor McAleer. Over to your seconder now, and that's Councillor Eamon Keenan. You have three minutes, Councillor Keenan. Thank you, Chair. I'll keep it sweet. Uh, we're running out of time, and Emmett does uh, put, the, put his proposal very well. Um, I suppose I'd like to say that, uh, as Emmett said, uh, the Radians got the financial back, and they've been afforded a lot of um, leeway by the various departments here and, and I've been meeting and collaborating with them and uh, 38,000 people have signed objections to this mine, local people and I believe so far these people have definitely, if anything they've been silenced, they definitely haven't got the support where they should have got the support from and I think Amit's, Amit's motion is very very good 
and the debt to now need to be offered a fair chance to fight this and they need to get any support they need to look into this judicial review. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Keenan. Uh, next speaker is Councillor Victor Warrington. You have three minutes. Thank you, Chair. This motion is making very serious allegations against both Balrabian and statutory consultees, of which there is no evidence to substantiate. We are very uncomfortable with that, and perhaps at the end of my speaking time, Chairman, I would ask the Chief Executive or Legal Advisor to co comment on the language in the motion used, particularly the phrase that NAE and DEER are facilitating the abstraction of water from bogs and bournes for the mining operations for the discharge of to toxic waste, including heavy metals, acids, and other substances into protected waterways. I am sure NAEA and DERA would deny that, and that really is a disgraceful allegation to level at public servants, never mind the company. Secondly, the Council's position is clear. We support the applications going to the PSC public inquiry. The motion calls for the publication of terms of reference for the public inquiry and seems to want some higher level of bespoke inquiry. It therefore calls into question the competence of the PSC undermines their independence and confuses the council's position around the PSC public inquiry. The motion questions whether it is open to the public and individuals to make rep representations. Of course it will. It's a public inquiry. All the technical and environmental issues will be examined by the relevant statutory authorities. Finally, the motion is clearly trying to revisit this issue of the council or some other public body funding Councillor McAleer's objection campaign. The motion talks about details on how fair and proper funding resources will be committed to and made available for protectors to ensure that this public inquiry is balanced and bared and transparent and that time and access to international expertise is facilitated to address fully all aspects of this complex series of environmental high-risk proposals. Ratepayers in our council are under financial stress as it is, without being asked to fund, fund planning objections for interest groups. This motion will give a blank check to a raft of consultants and lawyers to work for Councillor McAleer at a public inquiry. If he wants to hire these people, he can You're do so. With, with, uh, sorry, I haven't been three minutes, Chair. You're near enough there now. I have timed it. The okay. motion will give a blank check to a raft of consultants and lawyers to work for Councillor McAleer at the public inquiry. If he Chair wants to objection, these people, he can do me. that every other objector group does and go and raise the money himself. His colleagues in object in the objector group seem to have no difficulty in raising large amounts of money on the legal challenge took they took against the Radian a few years ago. In closing, Mr. Chairman, we are opposing this motion. This is far too much council time being wasted talking about this subject. The planning applications are going to the PSE public inquiry. We need to respect the process and let the DFA and Planning Appeals Commission get on with it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. And I will bring the Chief Executive in at the very end of the process here. Next speaker is Councillor Podgerdine Kelly. Thank you, Chair. Um, we, Sinn Féin, would like to support this motion. We are fully committed to protecting our area, our air, our water and our community. Sinn Féin believe in a transparent public inquiry, which is why Chris Hazard, then Infrastructure Minister, called for that public inquiry. We believe that the local people's concerns should be taken into consideration and thank Councillor McAleer for bringing this motion forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Next up is Councillor Mary Gardy. Thank you very much, Chair. And uh, this is always, and we've touched on the subject many times, um, a story with many sides or a coin with many sides has often been referred to. But uh, Councillor McLear has always showed his passion regarding this. And uh, I respectfully you know, take his views on board and, and always have. Um, at times, we've agreed to differ. But this, um, I think it's good we're engaged with the public inquiry. And I've welcomed the public inquiry for many years. And I'm delighted that finally, We've got there that it has been announced, but this motion is very wordy and very long. But when I drill, pardon the pun, when I delve into it, um, uh, that wasn't <laughs> intentional. Um, when, I, when I delve into it, I just see it that really, because there's such genuine concerns on all sides and varying views on it, 
really, Councillor McLear, in this motion that I can see, is looking for the publication of the terms of reference of public inquiry, inquiry and how it's going to be operated and some data on that. I think that's a fair request that he's looking for because of the concerns that some of his supporters would have. And indeed, would be good for all of us as a wider area to know how it operates. I just have one um, issue, and it maybe has been alluded to, but I am assuming, and if the Chief Executive could clarify, it's the details regarding the funding and resources in relation. I'm assuming that's in relation to the terms of reference and public inquiry. I just want the clarity from our Chief Executive that this is not um, referencing our council area and any funding that we would be giving, because obviously we'd have to do a cost and project and things like that. And so uh, if this is just obviously for information and questions, which you know, people will want to ask, um, I will support the motion and just clarity from the chief executive that this will have no, have no financial resource um, on us as a council and that this is questions to um, the department for clarity. Thank, Thank, Thank you. you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Gardy. I'll bring the chief executive in at the end of the process as you can answer all the queries there. Next up is Councillor Donald Coffey. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I want to preface uh, my comments on this really uh, by paying tribute actually to the community in the, the West Tyrone area and all the communities. And I note uh, with great pleasure actually that this is a campaign that unites people right across the divides. Uh, you know, this is something that will affect young people, young generations to come and, and everyone knows that uh, if, if you have to live with consequences of drastic pollution, uh, that the consequences are very severe for young children and, and future generations. So I'm very happy to see, uh, you know, the campaign. It's a, a really organic, strong, vibrant, dynamic campaign. 38,000 people have signed up an opposition to, uh, to this uh, motion. Uh, and I want to also actually say uh, how inspiring actually to me personally has been uh, the efforts of Councillor McAleer over the last three years. I've got to know him. He's one of the most outstanding uh, people I've ever come across in terms of defending his community. And I have to say, when I've been with the people in that area of West Tyrone, the respect that they hold him in is unbelievable. Um, this is a real David versus Goliath struggle, something out of the Bible. I'm sure you you uh, recognize that, Chair. Uh, this is something that we need to support the communities on. Uh, the community needs to be empowered. They're taking on, uh, you know, multinational, big corporate uh, behemoth, offering all sorts of, uh, uh, you know, uh, all, uh, promises in every direction. But the reality is that the the community have got nothing else but uh, that to stand together and to, to defend what they hold and what they've inherited uh, across generations. Uh, I I recognise great similarities indeed with the fracking campaign, the sort of organic movement from below the cross community nature, uh, the fact that a uh, huge abstraction of water is involved, contrary to what Councillor Warrington said there, the slag heap that's being formed, you know, it's the same sort of dangers uh, and the rotten role, I do believe, of the department and, and Storm in general on this issue. So I, I'm very happy to support this and uh, and hope uh, wish their campaign every success. I have no doubt that they will win out in the end. Thank you. Next up, Councillor Alex Baird. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I suppose like most councillors in the chamber, we have uh, to a degree and to a varying degree concern about uh, the, the process. But that's what the public inquiry will uh, uh, rule on, whether or not uh, the fears or concerns are there. I must admit the use of the word toxic twice in the proposal with no proof uh, that uh, a, a, a toxic threat is there or that toxic uh, waste will be discharged. That certainly concerns me. I, I, I do have concern about one word at the end, uh, that uh, international expertise is facilitated. To me, that sounds like a hidden agenda that the council has to fund that. And I would not, I, accordingly, like my colleague, Victor, I couldn't uh, agree with that at all, because that's what seems that there can't be any other uh, connotation on that. As an aside, we talked some time ago about the mine in Navan and having a visit to Navan to see what happens down there. I don't know whether the COVID restrictions or lack of them are such that we could uh, do that. But if we couldn't, I wonder, is it possible to have representatives from Navan Mine come up and address us 
and tell us because nobody wants to destroy the countryside but it was an opportunity for wealth to be created to right across the people in a, in a controlled way with no uh, uh, damage to the area of outstanding natural beauty well then i would support it but i cannot support this uh motion as i stated thank you and maybe a kind of clarity on the navam uh issue thank you yeah we'll get that clarity at the, at the, at the completeness uh next up is councillor keith elliott keith Yes, thanks, Chair. I'll keep it keep it short. Eh? Like Councillor Warrington there, um, I would like to ask: Can Councillor McLear stand over the allegations he makes against the NIEA and Andera about supposedly facilitating the abstraction of water from bogs for the discharge of toxic waste? I, I see he has no evidence provided as such. Our council already has a position to support the public inquiry. We need to let due process take place with uh, consultees allowed to consider the evidence at a public inquiry. There is no need for this continued discussion on this planning application. You know, we need to protect our ratepayers. I'm not sure Council Mark Lear does. Those who wish to attend the public inquiry can. It's open to whoever. But I believe that this council uh, should not... Uh, but I will not support the council having to pay expensive bills for international experts to make representation at the public inquiry as referenced in the motion. Uh, the, the DUP will not be supporting the motion. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Elliott. Can I just uh, make everyone aware, all, all councillors aware, that the chat function is for technical issues only? Okay. Last speaker on this issue is Councillor Josephine Dehan. Councillor Dehan. Thank you, Chair. Well, I, I want to commend Councillor McAleer for bringing forward uh, this motion. Uh, I think that it is absolutely essential uh, that we that the terms of reference for this uh, public inquiry uh, are published, uh, that we are able to scrutinise them. Um, a public inquiry, Chair, will achieve nothing unless it is balanced, fair and transparent. And on and unless each party uh, can make their points as fully and as comprehensively as possible, including uh, those parties that do not have uh, uh, financial resources uh, seemingly limitless at their disposal. But I think this is a good motion. I'm happy to support it, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Dehan. Okay, we're going to bring Chief Executive on for, for a few matters of clarification. Thank you, Chief Executive. Okay, Chair, thanks. There were a few items there um, that members had raised. Firstly, in relation to the terminology, the Council actually has previously issued uh, correspondence to various government departments and other agencies and the reference to toxic uh, extractive industries, toxic mining industries have been previously referenced, Chair. Obviously, it would be a matter for members whether they would wish to be supportive uh, of the motion as presented. Um, in terms of the other queries specifically regarding the financial implications of the motion, and I suppose just to be clear, Chair, is my interpretation, um, the, at a point when, when we are advised of the uh, formula for the public inquiry, the Council will wish to take a view, I'm sure, as to whether or not it's represented at the inquiry. But just to clarify, the council could not support the costs of any other party, be they community representatives or others. So the only cost that the council would uh, potentially support would be its own representation costs. My interpretation of the motion is that in asking for the publication of the terms of reference and the associated procedures, it is also making a request, um, presumably of the department as well as the PAC, that to allow for balance in the debate, the necessary central government departments make available funding to community and other interests. But just to confirm, Chair, that is not something uh, the Council would have any facility to do uh, nor any authority to do. And then the only other element, Chair, was in relation to the, um, the Navin visit. Certainly that was something that was uh, discussed. I don't think we had a formal proposal ar around it. But certainly, Chair, if Councillor Baird is making a formal proposal that we would undertake a visit, I know it was certainly offered to the Council, uh, we could investigate whether that's feasible in the current restrictions or, as suggested, whether representatives from Navin uh, could come to meet with the Council. So I think they were the, the main points that were raised in, in relation to questions, Chair. Thank you very much for the clarification, Chief Executive. 
Councillor sure Irving, I'll let you in very quickly. Yep, um, I'll second uh, Councillor Baird's uh, formal proposal that we get in touch with um, the mines down in, in Navan and seek some sort of correspondence uh, with regard to an actual site visit. Should that be preempted by a visit by them up here? But I think we need to go down actually and see what is on the edge of a town down in the Republic of Ireland. It doesn't seem to cause too much problems. Thank you. Point of order, Chair. Okay, there's a couple of councillors wanting to come on here. Point of order, Chair. Point of order, Councillor Tommy McGuire. I agree, my good. Carly, just on that issue of a visit to uh, uh, down south, I forgot the name there. Navan, I do apologise, it's getting late. Uh, uh, I have uh, tried to find out as much information as I can personally on, in relation to the mining uh, process down there. And to the best of my knowledge, it is zinc that is mined at Navan and it's not gold. So we would not be comparing lake with lake. I think the processes are uh, possibly different. I know the impact of mining may be generally the same, but it's not the same uh, mineral exploration. And therefore, I think that would be, uh, it would deem it unsuitable as a, as a trip to try and find out the processes of, of gold as opposed to zinc. That's my personal opinion, but I believe I'm correct. Chair, Grimmog. Thank you for that. Point of order, Chair. Point of order. And what point of order are you coming on, Councillor Yeah, uh, under under nineteen point one, uh, nineteen point nine, rather. Uh, I, uh, it states that uh, a point of order must be heard immediately. I was uh, disallowed to bring forward my point of order, but anyway. Uh, sorry, point of order sorry. I wish to Mr. raise, Poppy. Chair. Is... Mr. Poppy, hmm. don't speak when I'm speaking. Clarification from the Chief Executive. What, what point of order are you referring to? I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to raise the point of order that uh, the, the motion submitted has cannot be amended or subject to an amendment without a, uh, an amendment being submitted in writing beforehand the meeting. Thank you, Chair. There's no amendment there. Uh, I don't know what you're referring to. Well, uh, what? why are we discussing something that's not the motion in hand, sir, Chair? It's a separate proposal by uh, Councillor Baird and seconded by Councillor... Irvine, Councillor McGuire ha has give his uh, interpretation sure. of what's if, happened. If motions down. before us, we cannot consider any other motion, as you know yourself, Chair. Thank you. Councillor McAleer, I'm bringing you in for your summing up. Yes, Chair, and I'm mindful of the time again. I'll try and get through this as quickly as I can. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Councillor Kelly, Councillor O'Coffey and Councillor Dehan for their words of support. And of course, Councillor Keenan for second the motion in front of us. Um, it's disappointing, I suppose, to hear some of the other speakers who obviously, despite this being on the table now within our area for 10 years, still seem clueless on the complexities and the detail of what's actually included with gold mine. Councillor McGuire is 100% correct. The only similarity with the mine in Navan and the proposed mine at Coronelt is that they're underground and buying into the false narrative presented by Dalradian is very disappointing that councillors and people who are elected representatives can't do their own research or are unwilling to do their own research and they'll take the boards of paid PER companies to give them their information rather than doing a bit of research themselves. In relation to Councillor Warrington and I think a couple of other councillors mentioned the language used, uh, unfortunately they don't seem to be able to think back to November 2019 when a judicial review quashed the discharge consent application issued by NIEA under the guidance of DERA for discharging a number of toxic metal uh, toxins and heavy metals into the current alt barn uh, into Owen Kelly, the protected waterways up there. The gold mine in itself produces arsenic, mercury, lead, cadmium, chromium, and twenty other, at least twenty other heavy metals, as well as sulfuric acid and radioactive contaminants. We're in an area of high radon, and none of that seems to be registering with these Fermanagh-based councillors. Whatever the story is, there, I'm not sure. Dalradian, in their own application, have applied to abstract half a million gallons of water from the surrounding bog and peatland. They are also applied to remove 74 acres of bog or peatland for their infrastructure. 
And this is in the middle of a climate crisis, which this council has acknowledged and has backed previously. And I just like to conclude by saying that it's if if a needless or pointless trip to Navan is considered by the council, that a stop is also made in Randallstown at the waste disposal site, which isn't often on the PR brochures of any of the, the metals or minerals that are mined down there. I think it's unfortunate that this motion, which are, has already been censored prior to admission, is seemingly looking to be further censored. And I would just query on a, a point of clarification that the... Councillor the, McAleer, I'll ask why, you why, why, the, your previous comment. In relation to what, nobody Chair? Has, nobody has censored anything. Chair, I submitted Please. a motion and had it redacted and sent back to me for change prior to the meeting. I will bring the Chief Executive in. You're holding up production here, basically. I'm happy to move on, Chair. Right. We're concluding this motion here now, so wrap up your comments. Just an, a, a, fi a final point, I think it was raised in, in relation to uh, the, the input there from the Chief Executive. Just in relation to, I suppose, the, the right of or the, the position of unelected officials to detect, dictate really what the Council does and doesn't do. the two spades because it would have meant I would have had to go to another level. I would have had to go up to three. And I sorry, sorry, Celine, you're coming on there. Okay. Sorry, Eric, coming into the meeting. Uh, chair, everyone was unmuted there in that process. Heather. Okay. Yes, I do. I do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Everyone needs to put on their mute button. When you have four of a major, you use transfers when you have five.
Okay, okay, councillors, I think we're all ready to go again. Uh, sorry for all the disruption. Okay, uh, Councillor McAleer, you have about five seconds to bring your bring your uh, comments to a close. Yes, Chair, my, my last point then was just uh, querying the querying the fact that the from our last input there, the chief executive was telling or instructing what council couldn't couldn't bring forward or couldn't couldn't discuss could, can and can't discuss, and just as a non-elected member telling elected members what we can or can't discuss. I'm just querying the validity of that. Thank you, Chair. Right. Okay. You brought your comments to close. Thank you very much. I am now going to bring the Chief Executive in to answer a few queries and clarification. Thank you, Chief Executive. Thank you, Chair. No, I think um, maybe just to clarify, Chair, two, uh, two matters. Um, reference was made to censorship, which is inaccurate. Firstly, uh, matters were presented in the original motion, which were um, legally compromising to the Council to ongoing cases, to enforcement matters, and the motion as presented was legally unsound and unpresentable. Um, the advice was presented to the member who has proposed it, and certainly that has been accepted without question and no further clarification other than the points regarding the legal matters were, were queried. In terms of the um, instruction to members about what you can and can't do, uh, no, my role is only to provide advice, Chair. But what I can certainly say categorically is there is no provision for the council to provide for legal costs for any party other than the council. And if Councillor McAleer or indeed other members are operating under a different um, uh, uh, view, it is simply incorrect. So we have no legal basis on which to pay or contribute to the costs of any party other than the council. So. Um, it is the I'm required to give advice, Chair. Should members wish to operate outside that advice, then clearly they are in the grounds of surcharge. And that's the position. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chief Executive. And I think that is a stern warning to all. Let's be very, very careful with our wording and our actions. Right, there's division in the chamber. I'm now going to put your uh, proposal. Chair, can I call a recorded vote, please? Thank you. Yep. Yeah, your. I will now put your motion to the vote, and that is the motion as proposed by Councillor Emmett McAleer, and seconded by Councillor Eamon Keenan. Okay. Councillor Green, Green, just make a selection. Submit. Okay, that is the vote uh, concluded. I'll ask the Chief Executive now to clarify. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we had 14 votes for, 11 votes against, so the motion is carried. Okay, thank you very much for your cooperation, Olaf. Uh, just, I'm going to meet, bring the meeting to a close. There's now 10.21, just to Chair, advise. We extend that, the meeting? No, I'm not doing it. So, uh, just to advise that people can listen, just to advise that the, the other two motions will be on the agenda for a special council meeting on the 18th of October, 2021. Okay.
So thanks everyone for the cooperation. Thanks to our chief executive and to our democratic services team leader on my left and everyone who has attended the chamber and jo joined via WebEx. And thank you again to our IT team in the back. Keep us all right. The best of our ability. So thank you very much. And I now bring the meeting to a close at 10.21. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. 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 Thank you, Chair.